Thanks to hard-working generations of homesteaders, the remains of 100-plus-year-old orchards are scattered across Wyoming. Just about everywhere in the state, there, there is at least one, one big orchard that, that people would know about. It's, it's just part of this wonderful uh, history that we have here in Wyoming. You know, the first orchard in Wyoming was the Ed Young Orchard, and it was planted in about 1872. I suspect that Ed Young had this sense with where the river was, with the surrounding canyons, this would be just a perfect place for the orchard. He had over 3,000 trees at one point. It was all local, you know, and then of course they used, uh, sent a lot of apples by the, via the mule trains that went up Red Canyon Road to South Pass. Picking up on the success of the already established orchards around the Lander area, the University of Wyoming established its own experimental orchard in nearby Sinks Canyon. People wanted to have things that were developed specifically for the Rocky Mountains, specifically for the bad winters, specifically for the dry you know, summers and things like that. So inherently, people were very interested that, to have cultivars developed in Wyoming. This, in the old days, was their only source of fresh fruit, and apples do keep well. There were a lot of commercial orchard enterprises up around Sheridan, for example, and there's still a lot of remnants uh, up there. I know about three or four that are very large. I know four or five big orchards up in Powell, very old uh, orchards, not only from homesteading, but also from a commercial enterprise. There was a big orchard up in Ten Sleep. It's now operated by uh, by a church camp up there, and, and you wouldn't think why, you know that Laramie would be the best place to grow apples at 7,200 feet. But apples were so important to people that they they would find a way to to grow the apples. My favorite pie. Really, this apple. So there is such an extraordinary satisfaction to run out the back door, grab a few apples, pull a few onions, maybe find a few new potatoes with, say, a, a piece of deer meat that you got last fall. The uses of the apple for the pioneer was m much more important. Um, one of the best cleaning agents and disinfecting agents that you can come up with is vinegar. And so they, in the process of making apple cider, they would make some that turned to alcohol, some that would turn to you know, lactic acid and, and other things, and, and vinegar. If you wanted to make jelly, you had to have apples because you could extract the pectin by, by cooking it and straining out. So there's all these really neat applications if you're if you take the time to think about it and look at it and understand it. And some just inherently store better. There are apples that I've stored for nine months and they're just as good. So before the, the presence of, you know, Safeway and other big box stores, you know, you just go out to your apple orchard. Wyoming's surviving apple trees owe their endurance in part to the large rootstocks favored by the pioneers. When they're on the, uh, this Russian rootstock, they can grow, for the most part, 20, 30 feet tall without batting an eyelash. And they're so hardy, and the roots go down, and they survive. We went 11 years here in this drought, and the orchard didn't get any water. And we still had apples. These tall growing trees offer an abundance of fruit, but that only comes with ongoing care. Apple trees have to be renewed with pruning. So it's become a lost art, really. Uh, very few people really understand how to prune these trees. But well, we've lost all but two in this row, and then there are two more there. So we're losing a lot of them. Between the time that uh, we settled this country and, and, and now. I've read that there are almost 16,000 different cultivars, and now we're, we're down around 
four or five thousand, so we've lost ten or twelve thousand. Well, these apples won't ship. You know, I can barely get in the house and plunk a bucket down, and there's some bruises. So it, but the skin is so fragile and wonderful that I never take the skin off, and that's where the mineralization occurs that gives the apples sometimes a special flavor. These old apples are really quite rich in all kinds of vitamins and, and antioxidants in the skins and so on. I really think we need to be seriously considering what we're going to do with these apples. We need to have more interest locally in eating local apples, even though they don't look as shiny and pretty as they do in the store from Washington and uh, Oregon and California and so forth. Thankfully, there's a handful of stewards working to rescue Wyoming's remaining survivors. And that's one of the reasons why I started this project. You know, apple trees can grow. There's some in Europe that are 300 years old, but they have been meticulously maintained and pruned and cared for and, you know, all of the, all of the pests and stuff taken care of. Most of the orchards around here, you could say almost with, with certainty that they have been abandoned at some point. Some of them for maybe as long as 100 years or 90 years. Those trees that are surviving now are 130 years old. They survived drought, they've survived bad winters, they've survived all kinds of natural pests and everything. They have to be the most valuable ones for different areas in, in Wyoming. And spread across the state are some dozen market-worthy cultivars developed long ago. Um, this director, George Steinbrecht from Lander, kept very meticulous records, and they can't find it, okay? But in, there, in those records somewhere are all of the apples that he sent to particular farms. I know that they're out there. I gave a, a grafting workshop up in Powell. An older gentleman and, and his son came up afterwards and had this old piece of cardboard. And he said, you know, this is my grandfather's uh, orchard. He opened it up and the first three names that I saw were names from that list um, from Wyoming. This Brickstein, uh, Dr. Miller said, as far as he knows, that's the only one left them that they know of. The other holy grail was called the Fremont apple. That was one of the cultivars that they developed there. So I'm spreading the word as, as far as I can. You know, somebody on your you know, ranch or in your history um, may have talked about a Fremont apple. I'd really like to, to know about it. Those gifts from the past are kind of pointing the way to the future, if we really stop and think about it. How much longer are we going to want to depend on all of this stuff coming in from California, who's struggling with water and drought and fire, or the Pacific Northwest, when we can grow it here. I want nurseries in Wyoming to be selling apples that will grow in Wyoming and produce in Wyoming and last 130 years. Whenever anybody plants a tree, it's for the next generation. Thank you.